So I'm going to give a, just a, a brief uh, talk to start the day here, um, really looking forward to some of the things that I think are going to change the way we practice adult congenital heart disease and, and really talk specifically about um, genomics um, and operationalization of genomics as well as the use of 3D printing. Uh, so. Um, Let's start with, um, with genetics and genomics. Uh, so what's new in genetics uh, of CHD? Well, you know, uh, let's do a little background first. Epidemiological studies, clinical observations, um, and advances in molecular genetics have really contributed to our understanding of uh, congenital heart disease. There are several phenotype, genotype correlation studies that have suggested that specific morphogenetic mechanisms put in motion by genes can result in a specific cardiac phenotype makes sense. The use of new technologies has really increased the possibility uh, of identification of new genes and chromosomal loci uh, in syndromic and non-syndromic CHDs. And there are a number of methods now available to us for genetic research studies uh, of congenital heart disease, including cytogenetic uh, analysis, linkage and association studies, uh, copy number variation um, studies, and uh, this is really important uh, as we go forward, DNA microanalysis uh, uh, microarray uh, uh, analysis, and then whole exome uh, sequencing, and uh, you know, eventually whole genome sequencing as well. Um, the uh, altered dosage of contiguous genes um, inside these uh, CNVs, these, these uh, uh, variations, uh, can produce new syndromic CHDs, so that several new uh, and different uh, genomic conditions have now been identified. Uh, so the uh, 22Q11.2 syndrome, uh, the um, uh, duplication syndrome, uh, 22Q11.2 uh, deletion syndrome, among others. Um, molecular techniques uh, now, such as whole exome sequencing, have also led to the identification of new genes uh, for uh, monogenic syndromes uh, with CHD. For example, Adams-Oliver, Noonan's, Kabuki syndrome. Um, it's not easy to define precisely. Uh, the genetic defects uh, underlying non-syndromic congenital heart disease due to the genetic and clinical heterogeneity uh, of these mal malformations. But recent experimental studies have identified multiple CNVs contributing to these non-syndromic CHDs. So really our understanding of, of these conditions and their um, genomic um, uh, uh, basis is increasing, frankly, because technology is allowing us to look much more closely. Um, and uh, in a far more cost-effective way. The number of identified genes, however, for non-syndromic CHDs uh, at this time is still limited, uh, and each of the identified genes has been shown to be implicated in only a small proportion of congenital heart disease, so there's really still uh, a long way to go. The application of new technologies to specific cases of congenital heart disease and pedigrees with familial recurrence and filtering genes mapping in the CNV regions uh, may add knowledge about new genes uh, for non-syndromic CHDs. So that's, that's sort of the um, uh, overall background here. Um, uh, we're not going to go through this in, in a lot of detail here, but uh, this is uh, a table of chromosomal abnormalities and genomic disorders associated with CO, uh, CHDs. So annuloploides, we see a lot of patients with trisomy 21, Down syndrome. Um, and they have a series of, of uh, uh, usually predictable types of, of congenital cardiac defects, AVSD, um, uh, atrioventricular uh, uh, septal defects, VSDs, ASDs, and tetralogy fallot. You see Turner syndrome patients. Um, there's large cytogenetic abnormalities that can cause certain deletions or duplications uh, that have also been implicated in a variety of congenital cardiac uh, conditions. There's a variety of genomic disorders uh, that have also been implicated uh, in congenital heart disease. Take, uh, for example, the 22Q11 uh, uh, deletion, the George syndrome. Uh, we see a lot of that. 75% of uh, these patients will have some form of congenital cardiac defect, uh, uh, conotruncal uh, abnormalities typically. Um, Williams, uh, Van Buren, uh, Williams uh, Buren syndrome, Van Buren was a president, this is Williams Buren. <laughs> 
Uh, I don't know if he was a very good fighter, I don't remember. Uh, but anyway, be that as it may, uh, uh, supravalvar aortic stenosis. So, so a lot going on uh, here. But how do we demystify this, and how do we actually operationalize uh, genomics in uh, clinical care? Um, and I've been um, uh, working um, uh, over the last year with uh, a group here at UCLA, and, and our, our entire uh, group has actually been contributing to this effort uh, with Jessica Wang, who uh, I don't know if she's in the audience, if Jessica's here this morning, but uh, uh, Jessica is a cardiologist who graduated from our program and has um, trained and has a specific interest in cardiovascular genetics. And so she's opened up a cardiovascular genetics clinic um, that is in the same space where we see patients. And so um, it has been um, very easy uh, for us to um, uh, essentially uh, collaborate with Jessica and her team. Um, so by engaging the patient population as a real partner in precision medicine, lifelong health monitoring will facilitate not only improved diagnosis, but a sustained source of human samples for discovery research. Bigger picture, you know, we, we, we want to look ahead, not just, uh, as Dr. Uh, Lack spoke about yesterday, not, not just be happy with what we currently have, but really use some of these samples uh, to do biobanking and uh, look to the future. This infrastructure also serves as an asset, uh, asset for the health system uh, due to the increasing burden of cardiovascular disease and the diversification of the uh, American population. Uh, current cardiovascular healthcare delivery is guideline-based, uh, focusing on risk factor mitigation. Once disease manifests, medical treatment often proceeds without heed to molecular features that may indicate the effectiveness of one therapy over another, or explain why certain patients in certain subgroups uh, may tolerate something like pulmonary regurgitation for 30 years, whereas others don't tolerate it. Uh, after um, only a few years? Could there be some sarcomeric protein that's missing uh, or that's altered in that population? So uh, in a precision medicine environment, different scales of biological information are measured and become actionable, aiding in the clinician's management uh, of the patient. Uh, medicine will remain the art of treating the individual, uh, but this treatment will be better tailored by the molecular insights from a diverse population like what we see in adult congenital heart disease. This is Jessica right here, and this is her team. Jessica Raman is one of her research coordinators who, uh, um, an assistant who's basically with us at almost every ACHD clinic, enrolling our patients uh, so that we can do the uh, 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 biobanking uh, and uh, we can try to uh, do familial pedigrees um, and really learn more about them. So you take this diverse patient population um, and uh, you end up doing the genome sequencing uh, and that can be used for discovery research or it can be used for uh, biobanking and improving our uh, knowledge base. Uh, and it can help with diagnosis and prognosis. But even if we can't make that link right away, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't be doing this. Um, so. This is um, from this publication that we had in uh, circulation uh, research late last year about how to operationalize uh, genomics. And this is a, a, a big effort, precision medicine effort here at UCLA that involves all sorts of players. But note that adult congenital heart disease is central to this effort. And you go, well, why, why is adult congenital heart disease the focus of these major efforts at UCLA? Well, it's because we have a distinct patient population. We know that the patient population already manifests the diseases and, and malformations. Um, we know some of the genetic linkages that exist. There's still a lot more that we need to know. And we have an organized clinic, an organized system where if you're going to start, you want to start with a program like the ACHD program, well run. Uh, uh, clinics on a regular basis, um, staff and leadership that's very cooperative. And so uh, this year, that's, that's exactly what we've done. Um, and um, I think we're going to continue with these efforts, uh, and hopefully it will eventually result in 
some new discoveries and potentially some uh, better ways for us to prognosticate as to which patients uh, will do better or worse with given conditions and what that transmiss transmissibility may be for some of these conditions. Um, and things have even gotten simpler. Um, this is um, the uh, Invite Congenital Heart Disease Gene Panel. It's a total of, of 40 genes um, that can be checked. And so many of our patients are now in clinic uh, getting uh, this kind of genetic analysis, and we're doing it by just having them basically uh, spit into a test tube, um, which we then send off, and a few weeks later, we end up getting this report. Uh, something like this in the past cost uh, $3,000 to $5,000 um, just a few years ago. Now, um, most insurers will pay for it, and uh, the patient will not get charged more than about, I think, $475. But I don't even think any of our patients have actually been charged. So something that you can do in each of your clinics. Um, we use Invite. There are other companies as well. Um, so, you know, we're really bringing this now into um, the heart of our clinical practice. Um, and, um, you know, are we seeing any major changes in the way we treat people yet? No, no, but that doesn't mean that we will not with time. Um, let's go on now to 3D printing. Change gears. How is 3D printing valuable uh, to the treatment team as well as to the patient? Well, we learn through visual and tactile stimulation. Um, the intimate participation uh, of the surgeon or the interventionalist in the review of imaging data, particularly 3D volumetric data, is really important and very beneficial to our understanding of what we're going to go in and do. Um, I really, uh, you know, think it's, it's um, uh, subpar uh, if an interventionalist or a surgeon does not look at CTs or MRIs or echoes, decides to just go in and, and you know, do a procedure and rely on angiography and fluoroscopy alone. We're really past that era. 3D volume rendering of desired anatomy is becoming a seamless process uh, that can be performed on your PC or Mac. Uh, we use the OSIRIC system, for example, routinely now. And then patients love it. They absolutely love it. It helps them and their families better understand their condition. They feel more secure about the feasibility and the outcome of their planned procedure. Um, if you're telling someone that you are going to do some off-label procedure, placing a, you know, a large diameter uh, a sapient three valve in a native right ventricular outflow tract, um, you know, if you have done a 3D print of the heart like we did in this man, and you show him or her, well, listen, we've already practiced this. We've done it already in a model of your heart, and this is what it looks like. Then that person is much more likely to um, be confident that you're going to be able to do the procedure. Um, and then, you know, we simulate these procedures, and that can be invaluable for us as well, not just for the patient. So how is it done? Uh, I'm going to go through this very brief, brief, briefly. First, you start with image segmentation, uh, with Mimic software. And, and uh, hold on, is Ayman uh, Abdul Karim in here? Where is Ayman? Okay. So that guy right there is, basically has taught me pretty much everything I know about 3D printing. Um, he's a medical student who built his own 3D printer in his garage and then came and asked me if he could work with me and I said, great, of course you can. And then so we bought him a 3D printer that uh, he now uses in our office. Um, then you have to prepare the surface model and I'll show you a video of that. Um, then you do the 3D printing. So here is uh, how the segmentation works and this is using the Mimic software. It's actually very easy to do it. It's multi-planar here and it colorizes the 3D model itself and produces the 3D model for you right there and then. So you don't have to go through and do a bunch of segmentation yourself. Just do this. And then with a click of a button, you can take away certain structures and keep certain structures. So with the click of a button there, we took away the LV. Uh, we took away the uh, aorta. We took away the right, uh, left atrium. Um, and there we've just left the pulmonary artery and the RV, which is the portion that we think we want to print. And then here... We are doing, here, I'll stop this one. Here, you're sort of, uh, uh, you, you've made now a uh, smooth 3D volume um, uh, image here that uh, is almost ready for printing, but this is a solid image. And then you can make a shell of that solid image, like we do there. And then you prepare it for printing here 
by essentially having to lay it flat on this surface. This is a different program that does this. See how you have to kind of bring it and then lay it flat. You can't print it at an angle. Um, and then after that, you can do the virtual print. And that's exactly how it ends up printing on the 3D printer. So demystifying that as well. Some common 3D printing uh, technologies. By the way, we're going to have a, a number of, of models, 3D print models in the interventional station across the way. Um, so stereolithography, these are very durable, high transparency models. Um, they're good for visualizing catheters and devices, but they're not flexible. There's the polyjet uh, heart print flex model, multiple materials. Uh, you can have a softer, more realistic feel. Um, the binder jetting gives you this sort of cartoonish type model, multiple colors. It's good for training people and for showing families and such, but honestly, this isn't the kind of model that you want to do any practice runs on. You want to do it on this or this. And then other types, laser sintering, which uh, can include metallic materials. This is, this is going to be uh, very important uh, for us to be able to, in the future, print stents uh, and other devices, and then fused deposition modeling. Um, 3D printer types, the most common ones, the fused deposition modeling, FDM, the SLA, and the SLS. And this is an example of the fused deposition modeling uh, uh, printer. And this is, again, from, from Ayman. I think this is at Ayman's house, stop motion photography of that one model being printed. I'll get that out of the way. And then these are what these models look like. And we can print them pretty quickly. Uh, and here we went to Barney's Beanery. That's a beer in the back, and we have a we have a bunch of little models. And I think that's Dan Levy's thumb with uh, one of the models on it. So you know what used to cost us um, fifteen hundred to two thousand uh, dollars a model to get through materialize. Uh, now we can do at. Uh, I mean, how much does one of these models cost to print? Two to five dollars. Two to five dollars. Um, so, you know, now, now listen, there's a, there is a different, there's a difference in quality. There's a difference in quality for sure. But, um, here's what I would say is you don't need to drive a Ferrari every day from home to work, right? You need a Prius, you need a car to get you there. These allow us to print more models, do them more quickly and do them in house. Um, how about SLA? The SLA models, um, build layer by layer. It's a resin. It's a tough material. It can be flexible. Um, it's cost, costlier to print. Um, and then the SLS, I mean, these are the beautiful models. These are the models that are done on industrial type printers. Uh, the printers will cost you uh, over $100,000. And these are models that we've printed through Materialize. Um, and they give you that kind of flexibility to simulate real tissue. And here, there's even calcium uh, in this. Um, you know, Iman's figured out a way to do it with FDM as well. So, um, but you know, th there is a difference, um, but frankly, it's not worth the cost. Um, you know, what are the applications? Pre-procedural uh, planning, education, training. This is an example of a patient getting a stent in his uh, RVOT here, which has calcification. I think Morris was putting this in, um, in the office. Uh, and, um, you know, it's a good way to determine how things are going to sit and what they're going to look like. How do you implement something like this? Well, you've got a couple of options. You can outsource turnkey services, um, uh, and that really minimizes your startup inv investment. You can outsource 3D printing, um, or what you can do is do everything in-house. And that is what will cost you a lot less, is if you do everything in-house. And, and that's what uh, 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 we're doing now. Um, I haven't sent a, a model to materialize in probably the last six months. This is a case example where... Uh, we did a, we put together a model here of a patient with DTGA and um, did a practice run. This is what it looks like. And this is an SLA model. Um, and this was printed on a commercial printer. And you can just see here how the valve is inflating within the tricuspid position of this patient. Um, and here, just for the sake of time, I'll skip back past that. Here's another patient with a Bjork type Fontan, an RA to RV communication with uh, basically the right atrial appendage used as a communication. And again, we've segmented it, out, segmented it out and then printed the model, and you kind of can't tell which way is which here. But we, we then ended up putting a 29-millimeter um, uh, Sapien XT valve into this communication. My hope was that we could valve this uh, uh, RA to RV communication. It turns out that 
probably not such a good idea because it's a little bit too big and there's too much give to the tissue. Here is a um, vascular plug uh, that uh, was put in in order to see how we can prevent perivalvular leaks. But again, in this particular case, after doing all of this and testing the stability of the system, we decided it was not worth doing this on a patient. So it can help you do cases, but it can also tell you if the case is uh, uh, not going to be doable or if you're uh, going to have potential complications. You can predict them. Uh, this is an example of a, of a gentleman with a complex RVOT, and here's an example of predicting a problem. So we're inflating the balloon here, and then all of a sudden the balloon pops. Um, boom. So you know that this kind of balloon, and this was a, what's called a PTS uh, X balloon, uh, sort of a softer, more compliant balloon um, than some of the Kevlar-covered uh, um, uh, uh, valvuloplasty balloons. But you know if you use this balloon in this patient, um, the balloon is going to rupture. And then you could end up with an embolized portion of balloon or you can't get the balloon out. So a good way to predict whether this is going to work or not. And then here we did the pre-stenting, and this is a Sapien XT going into this location. Uh, again, showing that, you know what, this can be done. Uh, does this take like really fancy facilities? No. This is in my office and clinic. There's Morris, uh, and uh, he's blowing up the balloon. There's me with the model, and there's Sanjay taking pictures. Uh, and I believe these are Dan's glasses here. So, you know, future directions. We need to simplify um, the 3D rendering process. Uh, we need to have access to free or low-cost software for rendering and digital model preparation. Um, at this point, uh, we have to pay for a license, and it's a very expensive uh, yearly license. Uh, we need to implement re routine use of data for multiple, uh, from multiple sources, including 3D echo, rotational angiography, not just CT and MRI. We have to demonstrate clinical utility, improved safety, and improved efficacy. Right now, it's still in the, oh, it's really cool stage, but, you know, does it actually make a difference? Um, and that's where uh, prospective studies are needed. Uh, reimbursement. Uh, these are costly technologies, especially when you're sending uh, things out. You're buying a printer. It's going to cost you seven to ten thousand dollars. If you're not getting reimbursed, then then why are most people going to do it? They're probably not. Uh, we have to enhance have enhanced education of patients, students, and colleagues using this technology. We need to be able to uh, print. 3D interventional tools and devices, not just models of patients' anatomy, but also unique devices for that specific uh, uh, patient. Uh, we need to be able to print multiple materials so that we can actually mimic the in vivo properties of specific tissues, the elastic stiffness, hardness of these tissues. Um, we need to improve the quality uh, of affordable 3D printers. Um, and we need to have rapid in-house 3D printing, printing for urgent emergent procedures. What I'd like to have here is the ability within 24 hours to get a 3D print of a patient's heart so that if we need to go to the cath lab or the OR the next day or even a few hours later, we have the ability to have the model right there and then. And then we have to be able to sterilize it uh, so that we can actually put it on the cath lab table or on the OR table and then actually do the practice run potentially right there as well, um, not just beforehand. Um, so thank you very much. I want to give special thanks to Ayman Abdel Karim, who is currently, are you a third year now still, uh, Ayman? A medical student at UCLA, and his passion and technical ability have been absolutely integral to operationalizing a low-cost 3D printing program uh, here for us. So uh, uh, well done, Ayman, and also special thanks to Jessica Wang and uh, her team in cardiovascular genetics um, for working with us, um, and thank you very much.